On December 5, 2022, a capsule the size of half of a BB gets hit by X-rays generated by 192 lasers aimed at a capsule at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and for the first time in history, create a fusion reaction that generates more power than it took to create it. This is the breaking news out of the Department of Energy announced the day that we record this. And gentlemen, I just want to talk to you about the implications of nuclear fusion in this particular kind of nuclear fusion, which is referred to as inertial confinement fusion, not to be confused with another kind that's related to magnetic uh, forces. In any case, uh, I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, and this Right Angle is brought to you by the members of BillWhittle.com. And, and men, um, it seems like such a small thing. And in fact, the, the measurement of this fusion reaction and the energy that came off of it, essentially two megajoules uh, in, three megajoules out. Um, so that was the, the measurement. So they, they were trying to generate more energy than they put into it. Um, it. The time that this energy production lasted was measured, it was less than the time that light can travel one inch. So <laughs> this is, <laughs> I, heard somebody, I heard somebody on the news refer to it as, a, uh, as the blink of an eye. I'm like, no, 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 no. Nobody mm -hmm. blinks their eye that fast. <laughs> So in any case, uh, they have managed to create a little ignition event here that generated energy beyond what was put into it. And the announcement came from Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm, and then several other officials got up and spoke um, about the defense implications, about the implications for long-term generation of clean uh, power uh, and clean power that doesn't generate radioactive waste. Um, and and a lot of things that, that Bill and Steve have talked about before on this show. I will put a uh, a caveat on this. Yes, it was two megajoules in, three megajoules out, but apparently the creation of that laser beam, when a reporter asked later, what are we talking about as far as power from the wall? In essence, like when That's you- the calculation I just did. I yes. just did that calculation. So the power from the wall was actually 300 megajoules to generate the two megajoules of energy from the laser that resulted in three megajoules and a target gain of greater than one was their objective and they achieved uh, their objective. So this is they, being they, touted. They, the, Go ahead. I'm sorry. The, 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 the plus was one megajoule or two, three, three in and two out. It was two, oh, sorry, in, and two three in and out. three out. Two in and three okay, out. Okay. So I just did the math quickly. Uh, uh, that means that one megajoule is 277 watt hours. We measure our electricity in our house by kilowatt hours, thousands of watts per hour. This is one third of a thousandth of watt per hour. And that means that you could run a 60 watt light bulb for four and a half hours on the power that came out of this enormous machine. But if you built a billion of them, Right. No one's pretending that this that this is going to be the limit. Well, and that was a question, something... Bill, because they, they, they the whole thing they said was the the uh, the person who ran the laboratory, the woman who ran the laboratory said, um, now we look at can we make it simpler? Can we make it repeatable? Can we make it smaller? Yeah. Can so, we get it to a point last longer over decades that it will be useful for production on a commercial basis? Doing another quick calculation here. Oh, man, oh, we got well, a calculator uh, guy. Well, while Bill's doing math, I'll put my two cents in, uh, which will power a light bulb for a fraction of a second. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can't call myself a science nerd because my math skills were never good enough to be a science nerd, but I was always a science fan from the time I was I was a little kid. First Lego set I remember building, the, you know, it wasn't just a collection of bricks. It was an actual kit was the Lunar Lander. It was so cheesy and I loved it. Hmm. All the space stuff, I grew up loving it. Uh, the first coffee table book I ever got, dad gave it to me, I think I was 11 years old. It was Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I still have it downstairs on the big bookshelves. Uh, so space, science, laser beams. Give me laser beams. That's I don't even need the freaking sharks. Okay, just I want laser beams. This, this has been my whole life, but I got burned badly because I think it was 19 years old. The first time I realized just how badly science could screw it up. Remember Cold Fusion back in uh, 1988? I do. Yes, I do. 89. I certainly do. Yes. Oh, that was exciting. Um, so for, for, 
Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were done. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we had Cold Fusion that, that did not pan out. And it seems like even before that, about every five to 10 years, we would have a new fusion breakthrough that would mean clean fusion power in about five or 10 years from now. This has been going on at for, least for all of my years. life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's what's interesting about that. So there's a, uh, not only is it possible I made a mistake on the math, it's likely, but nevertheless... <laughs> If it takes this billion dollar facility to produce enough electricity, run a 60 watt uh, light bulb for four and a half hours, that can sound kind of depressing. But the um, the distance from Los Angeles to New York is pretty nearly 2,500 miles. And the first flight of the Wright brothers was 120 feet, yeah, uh, which yeah. is not the width of the runway, let alone the length of the runway. And, um, and so the, 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 Amount of the output is not what matters. The fact is you crack the egg. That's what matters. And, um, and once you, once you can, once you can fly, then it's just a question of building better airplanes with more power and, and, and getting to fly longer and further. If you, and once you get more energy out of a reaction than you put into it, then it's just a question of doing the same. It's just iterating it. And the fact that they were able to get more energy out of it than they put into it, and nobody said, oh, no, there goes Tokyo. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. Fusion, here's what I predict, and, I, and, I'm, and I've felt this for a long time. So for those people who are not familiar, just very quickly, nuclear power, as we've understood it since the, the 40s, and nuclear reactors probably started in the 50s, late 50s, 60s here in America. Uh, it take heavy elements, and and when you put enough of them together, you re reach a critical mass. Neutrons come off of these heavy elements. They split other atoms. These release neutrons. This is a chain reaction. Generates a lot of heat and also generates radioactive spent nuclear fuel. And mechanically, there are ways to, to shut down that reaction, but those can fail. They failed at Chernobyl. So once you put all of that uh, radioactive material, uranium or plutonium in a in a close enough environment, then you have to have a mechanical system to shut it down, right? Fusion is so is so unbelievably complex that if there's the slightest hiccup, the thing simply stops. It just there, it, there, and and the fuel is is usually just hydrogen. It's just it's and and it's a pellet, right? So so this thing this cannot. This time they said it was deuterium and tritium. Right. It can't even explode. The second that it starts to explode and damage the inside of the containment field, the containment shuts down. And it's it's perfectly yeah. safe. There's no radioactive waste. It runs on seawater. Right. It is it is the answer. And and my prediction is, is that if this starts to get serious after 50 years, we are really suddenly going to see the environmental movement go into spasms. Right spasms oh, they'll because hate they'll, get, get, they'll do everything they can to destroy it. Yeah. Because I've heard a number of, of leading environmentalists say the worst thing that could happen to planet Earth would be for humans to have a clean, cheap, renewable source of energy. Uh, that, that'd that be the, that'd be the worst. They hate us. You, they, they do. So if you have nuclear, if you have, if you can get nuclear fusion, then there is no argument against it. You build, you build as many fusion plants as you want to, it, it it doesn't pollute anything. It doesn't add to the whole carbon, that whole nonsense. It doesn't do anything. It just produces a lot of power. And when that happens, the green movement is going to have to reconfigure their arguments. And then it'll probably be because we're suffering a catastrophic world shortage of hydrogen. And that's that's probably what they'll they'll try to tell us. Now, there was a, a slight moment of conflict at the news conference at the Department of Energy when Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm was talking about the president's, uh, what she referred to as a, uh, let me see, a, the president has a decadal vision to get to a commercial fusion reactor. Um, at, at another point, the woman who's running the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory said that uh, she thinks that it will be decades before we get to a commercial deployment of this to a, in order to be able to be a power generating source for anybody. Decades, she said, but maybe not five or six decades, which is what it's been since the first kind of ideas that this could happen to now when, you know, there's a long 
gap between the knowing and the doing. And so the knowing started in the 1950s. The doing didn't get here until now. So she still thinks it's going to be multiple decades. But of course, politically motivated people like a president or a secretary of energy are more inclined to say, yes, if we can put a man on a deuterium pellet by in 10 years <laughs> and bring it back safely. Well, that's the tricky part. Um, from the first Wright Brothers flight until Neil Armstrong putting his foot on the moon wasn't even 70 years. Uh, the flight progression was amazingly, amazingly fast. But uh, all the progress that we've made in aviation, we made during the first half of, of the of aviation. Basically, all yeah. of it. Um, with fusion is so much more complicated than heavier than air flight that I, I don't think we're going to get <laughs> that kind of a, a, a progress acceleration from from zero to 60 and almost nothing. Nuclear fusion and, and artificial intelligence have one thing in common, is and that is that they're both just five years away, and they have been for the last 50 years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is, um, that alone is is a data point that people should be interested in, right? Because if you, if you think about that for a second, because I'm not exaggerating, people, scientists and engineers have thought that nuclear fusion and artificial intelligence was less than a decade away at the most. And they've been thinking this for seven decades, six decades now, right? So what is that telling you about the um, about the mindset of, of some of these cutting edge scientists? They have grossly overestimated their understanding of the problem. They They have if you if you are saying that we think this thing is 10 years away and you're saying it for 60 years and you still haven't gotten there and it's still 10 years away, then you have to ask yourself, what is it about your estimation that it's 10 years away that is so off? Why are you why are you well, that wrong for so long? It's because we it's don't know much what harder we don't, than you think it is. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah. You know, we only know but, what we know and we think from what we know that we can project what we will do. But then we find out, oh, we are children in this little game <laughs> and we are, our, so our knowledge is so elemental that we're just scratching the surface. Scott Ott is talking to you, carbon future <laughs> planet is being destroyed computer programs. Yes, precisely correct. Things are much more complicated than they seem to be. And, and these engineers and these scientists who are predicting these things thought they had it all figured out in their little train set. They thought, oh, it's just this and this, nothing to it. Just put them all together. Bam, boom, there it is. No, it's much more complicated than that. And this is exactly the same thing with this whole environmental argument, right? Planet's going to die in six years if we don't all just start eating bugs. That's what they're saying. And people believe it. Well, and and it's it's just... In in that case, that's just political lying. It just shows the humanity of the people that are engaged in this. I mean, the, the scientists are people too, you know, and they they're hopeful, they're hardworking in many cases, and they think that they they think that they're right on the cusp of a big breakthrough. I mean, how many people watching us right now have gone through their entire life thinking, "Today's the day. This is the week. This is my year. Uh, this is the time it's going to happen for me." And then it just takes a little longer and a little bit longer. And so that's encouraging. The other thing I love that shows the humanity of these scientists too is that the energy department announced there would be a news conference on Tuesday of this week that we're uh, recording this. And Sunday or Monday, the word already leaked as to what the news conference would be about. And so so the discussion in the media was already about, okay, they've achieved a fusion reaction and like stuff. So when they go to make the announcement, they're like, ladies and gentlemen, ta-da! And everybody went, yeah, yeah, we know. Yeah, we, we know. Yeah, I saw it in the Wall Street Journal. I think I got the alert on Sunday night that this thing was coming. Yeah. Maybe it was Monday morning. But these 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 leaks are almost impossible to avoid now. Um, the thing is- I love the, is, uh, Steve, when they said uh, the people who leaked this information to them did not want their names released as to not get out ahead of the news. I'm like, wait a minute, you're <laughs> leaking. It's it's out <laughs> ahead of the news. That's exactly right. The thing is, as, as exciting as this is, I'm not getting excited until I see it repeated because that's the whole point of yeah. science. Oh. I, 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 no one stands before me when it comes to appreciation for what the human species is capable of. I am on a daily basis amazed and blown away by what, by what we're able to accomplish uh, 
because of the cooperation, because of standing on the shoulders of giants. It's not their humanity I'm worried about. It's their humility. The, the, there is a tendency for people in, in extraordinarily complex fields who, have, who understand how complex a field is. There's a tendency for them to, to eventually underestimate the difficulty of the problem. And, and that is something that fusion and AI have been dealing with for 50 years. And you would think that after 50 years of underestimating the difficulty of the problem, they would stop making predictions like it's only five or 10 years away, right? That's the part that I find worrying. It, it's, that, it's, that, it's that sense of, of, okay, well, now we understand it. Well, that's what they said 10 years ago. And that's what they said 10 years before that too. Maybe instead of saying, now we understand it, maybe you could be saying, well, now we understand more of it than we did before. We're going to build on that. But there are so many unknowns here that we don't, we can't tell you when this is going to be available. You know, I will tell uh, you. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, Several years ago, uh, when we were first starting to find out very publicly, all these teething problems with with fully autonomous self-driving cars, which is the one of the mm-hmm. ultimate AI problems. Um, I had a commenter, and I can't remember if it was a vodka punter or an Instapunt, explain to me that now that Tesla was gearing up production uh, for their their, ma- their first mass market cars, the, the Model 3, that a network effect was going to kick in because they would be collecting so much more data. Every every additional Tesla sold was going to add to the the add to the AI. And that we were at tops four or five years away from fully autonomous self-driving cars. That was uh, way more. That was more than four or five years ago, and we're still not much closer than we were then. See, this is the point, right? The look, I am. Sur- I, ha- I have problem. so many friends who are engineers. Uh, and 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 people who I've worshipped my entire life, some of the most legendary engineers in the business are people who are my friends. I understand engineers and I understand that the good engineers are always aware of what they don't know and how many things are hidden out there. Sorry. Your your example with Tesla is is a great example, but but this is this is really the point, the main point I'm trying to make is not even that they're that their predictions are are falling short. It's that they take for granted what humans do automatically as being something that is mechanically reducible. I mean, what they're basically saying is the the best engineers, computer scientists, and AI on the planet cannot drive a car as well as an average suburban housewife can. And, And it's not so much even that they're overestimating the technology as they are completely underestimating just how complex the yeah. human mind is and just how astonishingly powerful it is so that to, to think that you well, well, we've got Tesla and we got all these computers, we got artificial intelligence and billions of calculations a second. Well, what we're doing with our brains puts that to shame. I, th- and- I think there, Bill, there's a couple of, of dynamics here though. Um, I, my take on the press conference that I watched was that the people who are actual scientists, and I'm uh, Jennifer Granholm came across as knowing the topic, so but she's a politician, so mm-hmm. I did I don't count her among the you know the actual scientists. But the the woman who ran the lab, and a, there was another woman who ran a couple two other women that ran some agencies that are scientific agencies, and all of them spoke in very reserved terminology about yeah. the what was happening here and about how Good. much work lay before them. Um, and, real scientists. and I think that the prediction stuff that you guys are talking about is driven more by the natural inclination of journalists and others to say, how long, how long, how long? And in fact, one of the scientist women who got up there started her talk by talking about the vast gulf between knowing and doing, the thing I mentioned earlier. Um, and she was heading off those kind of questions. But the first question out of the mouth of a reporter when they opened it up for questions was, how long? <laughs> and you feel like you well, need to tell them something. Well, well, and and then so the answer the, the answer to that question is if you're a real scientist, I haven't got the faintest idea. Yeah, yeah and the real scientist said some decades. <laughs> some decades. <laughs> I, I hope I, really I hope I still, live to see it. But, I genuinely but do. See, see, but see, they just did it again. Right? They just did it again. Now I, I look. Now it may be they never discover I, it. <laughs> 
Look, I don't want anybody to misunderstand this. This is an enormous breakthrough, and I am extraordinarily proud of them, proud of the human species, to be able to create the conditions at the center of the sun in a laboratory someplace. That's a pretty impressive achievement, right? And I'm not taking anything away from them. What I'm saying is, is that is that when people who are in order to do what they do, their knowledge has to be so deep but it's also extraordinarily narrow. And when people like this start getting into predictions, forget when they get into politics about global warming and stuff, when they get into predictions and say, oh, it's probably going to be a couple decades, you, you don't know that, right? It's, can you just come out and say, we haven't got any idea. We thought it was going to take 10 years and we thought that for the last 50 years. We have no idea. <laughs> We've made a major milestone, but, it, this, but the situation could be proved much more complicated than it looks now. That's certainly been the case for the last 50 years. And, and the, reason I'm, the reason I'm hammering this is because we live in an age now where there are at least some genuine scientists who are available for quotation on the press to say that the science is settled about COVID, the science is settled about the environment, the science, anybody who says science is settled doesn't understand what science is. And, and when you have politicians who are trying to don the mantle of science in order to bully people into doing what they say because they're they're trying to say that well scientific so, science is on our side no it's not no it's not <laughs> science process. science doesn't have political opinions science doesn't science doesn't make science doesn't make statements about human behavior right well, that's and That's the reason politics. I'm pushing back at this, Bill, is because I don't think it's just a science phenomenon. I think it's a human nature phenomenon. And I'll give you oh, an absolutely. example. I mean, in my in my W-2 world, I work at a retail store. The most common question I get immediately after telling somebody that we don't have an item in stock, but we can order it from the manufacturer is what? <laughs> How will you get it? When will it be here? The real answer is, I don't know. What do you tell them? I don't know. Well, and then, then they you go, need to be yeah. in a, you need to be in charge of the, uh, the, the National Science Foundation. But then, but here's what happens. They say, I, I say, I don't know. And they go, come on, you must have some idea. I'm saying, no, honestly, I don't really know. Well, what does it usually take? And I said, there's no real usual. And, um, and they go, well, you, I, I don't want to buy something if I have no idea. So then I said, look, ballpark could be more, could be less, two to six weeks. But we really don't know. And I say I don't know several times. I make an I don't know sandwich. And You're I put, not the problem. I put the estimate in the middle of it and then tell them I don't know again. And I've had people who will walk and go to some other store and they go to the other store and they say, how soon will it be here? And the guy goes, ah, three weeks tops. Well, no, he doesn't know either. But he'll tell them. <laughs> and I won't. Sell, could, and so he'd that's- he'd rather sell the couch than be honest. But people want- People want to know. And what happens is if you don't tell them, then they lose hope. And so if you don't say, well, maybe some decades, or as the president is saying, one decade, or as you said, other people have said, maybe five years. If you don't give them something, then they're going, oh, well, this is just some sci-fi thing. C call me when you get much closer. That's the answer that they should be given. I agree. But congratulations, man. More, that's the holy grail of fusion, right? More energy out than energy yep. in, even yeah, if it's, it's an erg, force. right? It's that's that's when that is the that is the Wright Brothers flyer actually skimming above the ground under its own power. And if it does 120 feet, it does 120 feet. But the thing flew, right? First time ever. And that's an enormous achievement. And and the reason I brought the Wright Brothers up is because once one of the things that's most that's most important about the about the discovery is not even that we flew or we flew a little different distance. It's that we flew it all. We 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 yeah. the, the Wright brothers have been working on this thing for four or five years before this, they this thing the happened principle. every day, right? And they didn't know if it was going to work. So just knowing it works is the incentive to um, is to do more. And by the way, after the Wright brothers. Uh, the, after the right flyer flew, the Wright brothers disappeared for two years. It just it just disappeared. They were they were filing patents, right? And and the reason they were filing patents was because the instant it was done, now everybody in the world wants to do it, right? Because they proved it could be done, and and hopefully this is what we're going to see with 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 
the fusion thing. Yeah, and Secretary the, Granholm system, said that there are lots and lots of private sector companies that are working right now on fusion, and the government wants to encourage that uh, kind of thing. There's a she she emphasized several times, and I thought surprisingly not in the normal cloying way that politicians do about private public partnerships. She like it came across as pretty natural. It's like okay, this is okay, what great. government does, and companies are going to do this, and that's great. We want them to do that. Um, it, it's interesting when you win when. You you actually create a fusion reaction in a contained <clears throat> space um, and, and it produces more energy than it took to <clears throat> produce the energy. The question that doesn't come out of anybody's mouth at the news conference is, hey, how much money have you spent over the past five decades <laughs> trying to get to this point? Well, this one's worth the money yeah, because, because this is the holy grail, right? You get this right and, and, and the entire world changes. You get this right and the environmentalists no longer have any case. There's no longer any any case to to do any of the things they want to do and and then you literally can grow cotton in the mojave desert if you want to because energy is essentially it's essentially free it's essentially endless and it's essentially um uh consequence free yeah. right it's well, it's it's not building it's out not the infrastructure the is uh <laughs> it's gonna be pricey but once it's in place it's gonna be pricey once it's in the place, guy from the uh I think he was a Defense Department guy, so he kind of talked about the military implications of this. And there were there were like three major foci um, that they talked about. They said, uh, first of all, doing something like this, and, and this is something that's been ongoing for years now, uh, reduces our need to test our nuclear arsenal. Um, we, if we can create things like this in the laboratory, we can come up with reliable predictions on how things are going to work, uh, and we don't need to to detonate bombs, essentially, to find out uh, whether they work. Uh, well, secondly, the years. fact, yeah, and the fact that the United States has done this and done it first also provides what he kind of referred to as a credibility deterrent against our enemies. In other words, hey, we can do this stuff. And that gives you a little swagger on the international geopolitical stage uh, oh. that that lets your lets your enemies know that you know you're not just resting on your laurels of past accomplishments that you have powers. And then finally, um, he said that it helps to advance our non-proliferation goals. And he didn't uh, he didn't emphasize how that is so. But basically, they they made a pretty strong pitch for the defense implications of this in addition to the clean energy part. And the guy said at one point, he said, uh, this just not only lets you know that the U.S. can do things, uh, but we're hiring. And he was basically saying to young people who have IT chops and engineering skills and math skills, hey, this is Lawrence Livermore Lab and these federally government funded labs are not some old musty place. We're on the cutting edge and we're hiring and we want you. And I bet they're hiring the best engineers, and I bet they're not hiring according to diversity and inclusion standards. And anybody who gets to work there gets the satisfaction of knowing they're working there because they're the best in the world. And nobody's nobody's going to question that. When I first, when you first told me about the the news that this was working, and they they said, "Well, we're going to now we're going to start doing this." My first reaction was, "Give it to give it to Musk." And and the reason I say that is because there's nothing magical about Elon Musk. Elon Musk didn't didn't he actually did some engineering on on both the tesla and the and the uh, spacex but he's he he didn't build these things and he didn't even really design them the reason that that i would say give it to musk is because his management style is extraordinarily clear he owns the company he gets to he gets to make a single decision that doesn't have to go past a board and then he hires the best people he can, and he expects the very best out of them. And, and he's iterate, open iterate, about this. Iterate. He's saying, I don't care if you fail. You fail as many times as you want to, but you better learn something when you fail. And if you're not giving it everything you've got, then I'm going to find somebody else. That's the attitude that will get you there. And and often with the government, just just take take all of the whole bureaucracy out of it. Just if you can't imagine that for a second, if you're if you're if you're dealing with this at Lawrence Livermore, right, you are you are constantly asking yourself the question: What is my funding going to be this year? Yeah. What is my funding going to be next year? Is it going to be cut? What am I going to do with this? All of this. If you got somebody like Elon Musk saying, "No, we're going to go. We're going to do this until we get there, and we're going to spend whatever we have to spend to get there." So get there. Let's get there quickly. 
if we have to if we have to blow up 60 rockets in order to figure out how to make this rocket fly, then let's be blowing up a rocket every week instead of every three years, right? If we have to if we have to go through the failures to learn where the bugs are, let's do it. And so it's it's not even it's not like it's him as an individual that is the the you know Dr. Manhattan that just comes, this stuff comes out of his head. It's like he, but he is the only guy out there who understands how you, how you succeed in cutting edge technologies, right? It's a combination of don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to try. But at the same time, if you're going to blow up a rocket, you need to know why, and 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 you need to make sure that whatever blew it up that time doesn't blow it up the next time, because there are other things that are going to blow up that we need to learn, right? So if this fuel pump blew up on on this one test, fix that fuel pump, and I don't want to see that fuel pump fail again, right? I want to, I want something else to fail now, and and that's how you learn these things, which is why I have no confidence in either Bezos or STS, but we've covered that so yeah. many times. It's yeah. just bloody pulp now. I yeah, wrote about but, it again yesterday. Jeez. Just to just to wrap this up, um, it's it's an exciting day for the country. It's an exciting it's day for day. humanity, frankly, um, even though I may not live to see the clean, cheap, you know, waste free power that is promised by such a thing. In fact, none of us, nobody may ever live to see that. But it's exciting to be able to look back and tell your grandchildren or your great grandchildren, hey, I remember when they announced that 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 fancy new car you're driving out there. I remember when they first made that possible. <laughs> And uh, that's that's exciting just to just to watch the stupid news conference. Um, I really enjoyed that. The other thing I thought, without saying it, they said it. Um, they had uh, of the four or five people who addressed the press at the initial thing, and then afterward they had like a geek panel where the scientists were going to be interviewed. But the initial announcement, I think there were three or four women and one man up there. And I know there's been a great push to say, why can't we get more women in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and what is the M? I forget. Um, but why math? Why can't we get more women in STEM? And here was the woman who runs the Lawrence Livermore Lab. And here's the other woman who's like a nuclear person. And here's, you know, so they, by their example, and clearly were passionate science geeks who were really into the to the nuts and bolts of it all. That was inspiring to see as well. Um, and I, I, I love what one of the women said. She said, you know, going forward, there are going to be great days and there are going to be bad days. There are going to be ups and there are going to be downs before we get to the point where we're able to produce something that, that fulfills the promise of this moment. Um, we need to be able to muscle through that and not lose hope as we continue to advance. And, um, and in a sense, as, as Bill, I think, has mentioned before, and I think all three of us agree, um, there are some areas that government only can do. And one of those is kind of basic research that has no immediate commercial uh, consequence, but may have a benefit for national defense and long-term benefit uh, to commercial applications. Uh, this is one of those things. And I think uh, three conservatives here can be very happy to see it happen. Very happy. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members of BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible.